you're listening to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast and very welcome you are to the latest episode in our series. And with the five star ratings racking up, it's no wonder you've chosen to join us. Thank you for finding us, particularly if it's your first time dipping into one of our episodes as we uncover some of the stories of the personalities that make up the heart of AFC Bournemouth. This is Chris Temple, Cherry's commentator for BBC Radio Solent and AFCB TV. And alongside me once again on the podcast is AFCB club journalist Neil Perrett. Neil, hello. Hello, Chris. Oh. You can tell we have a very important guest today, Neil, because we're in the boardroom and, and Riff Raff, like you and I, don't normally hang around in places like this. No, we don't. Um, I think um, I'm looking forward to the fillet steak and the red wine when it arrives. Do you know when that will be? That's a staple, yeah. I would imagine half time. We don't have half time. That's a bit of a problem. Well, let's move straight on with our guest for this episode, shall we? He's one of the most recent arrivals to Vitality Stadium. And after a whirlwind first few weeks, today is a chance to find out a bit more about the player, the coach and the man behind the initials JW on the Cherries tracksuit. It's a warm welcome to the gaffer, head coach Jonathan Woodgate. Afternoon, afternoon guys. It's great to have you with us. Um, thank you for sparing some time amongst a, a very busy schedule of, of games. Um, we're going to crack straight on because there is so much to get through, Jonathan. Um, we're going to come on to your time here a little bit later, but we're going to start right back at the beginning, if that's all right. Um, where it all started. Born in Nunthorpe near Middlesbrough, what are your earliest memories of growing up and maybe being thrown a football for the first time? <laughs> earliest memories for me in Nunthorpe Middlesbrough was just kicking balls about on the street kicking balls against the garage door neighbours going crazy because I'm making a racket outside and you know every, every time you'd go somewhere was it you'd walk to the shop you'd have a ball with you you'd go to the park you'd have a ball you'd go play in the woods you'd have football so that was just uh, the area I grew up in there was a lot of kids on the same in the same estate as me and it was a great time growing up, to be honest with you, with everyone on the on the streets at the time. And it's not it's not the same anymore now. Kids can't really play out t- till all hours. My mum used to shout, "Dinner's ready." She used to call out the door, and not, I'd be straight in dinner, then I'd be out again, football again. So it was just that as a as a young kid growing up, that's all I wanted to do. I guess this is a slightly silly question, given that the North East is a hotbed for football. But what members of your family were your inspirations? And was there other football interest in your family? Yeah, well, my father was a massive Middlesbrough fan. Uh, my mother's from Seam, which is um, near Sunderland. And she was a Sunderland fan, as was my my, my, mum, my mum's side. was He was a Sunderland fan. My dad's side was Middlesbrough. So I ended up being Borough. I used to go to the games from, from eight, 1986 onwards, really. And I went every single week with my dad to the home games. Uh, and loved it. Absolutely loved going to Wesson Park. Loved then going to the Riverside and watching all the special talented players. Um, my dad didn't always push me into playing it. I just really loved playing the game. Did your mum ever try and drag you up the coast of Sunderland before you got hooked on Middlesbrough? Oh, no. <laughs> she didn't have a say out, mum. <laughs> my mum didn't have a say. It was <laughs> oh, my dad. You're a Borough fan, son. <laughs> you used to get two... I don't know, did I hear in another podcast, you used to get two burgers on the way to the game. That was one yeah. of your standout memories. Yeah, well, my, my granddad used to live right close to the stadium, Brompton Street, because the Ayrson uh, Park was right in the in the centre. Uh, Ayrson Park. And my, my, my granddad lived on Brompton Street, so he used to park the car outside, go to Brompton Street, watch certain Greavesy on the telly, walk down the cobble, the cobble streets, and there was always a burger van in the exact place I'd go to have two burgers <laughs> and straight in the ground. Was like, Great what times, to be honest with you. Great <laughs> times. You know, when you're a kid like that, you don't dream that you're going to play for the town. You're going to captain them. Um, so you fulfil dreams. Chris and I once attended, uh, the first game we went to was at Feetham's, Darlington's home ground, and Chris said, here we are on Teesside, and he got absolute daggers from all the locals. Yes. Would you say you're a Teesider or a North Yorkshireman? No, I'm Teesside. Definitely? Yeah, I'm, yeah, Middlesbrough. Middlesbrough's Teesside. It's, it's an, it is, can't worry, it's North Yorkshire now, but I'm a Teesider. Second question is probably not overly relevant to your career, but we understand you were introduced to the delights of Shea Fred recently, the uh, award-winning fish and chip shop in Westbourne. Now, one of our colleagues has a criticism, there's no gravy. Did you agree with that? Yeah, there, there wasn't any gravy, actually, and Northern boys like a bit of gravy, don't they? And when I... When I uh, when I go up north, I always have. I love fish and chips. We have a one round in Red Car uh, called Sea Breeze. Oh, it's unbelievable, unbelievable. Harry told me to go to Chef Red. Uh, well, it was nice. Pretty similar to Red Car. Yeah, there, no, they weren't too expensive. Because okay. the first time I come down here, my missus got a pepperoni pizza. It was eighteen pound, and I couldn't believe it. I felt like saying, "Take that back." How big was it? <laughs> like that, <laughs> big. No, but the prices were quite similar, so I was a surprise. Now this this is quite a long one, but it's 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 going back to when you first started going to watch games 
Um, and I understand you followed Borough first of all in the late 1980s. Now, Bournemouth supporters when have, back, yeah, division. have very yeah. fond memories. Exactly, exactly what I was going to yeah. come on to. Uh, here we go. Stephen Pears, Gary Parkinson, Alan Kernigan, Colin Cooper, Tony Mowbray, Gary Pallister, Gary Hamilton, Paul Kerr, David Hodgson, Bernie Slaven and Archie Stevens yeah. were the starting eleven in a game here in the March of that season that Bournemouth won on their way to the title. Just give us your memories of those early days. Oh, then that that team I could name off by heart. That was a team I loved, adored, um, and it's everything that I wanted to be when I grew up watching that team play because they had a manager in Bruce Rioch with the assistant and Colin Todd. I was only eight, six. I want, what, what, what year was it again? Uh, eight, that was 86, 87. 86, so I'm, I'm, I'm six, seven year old, but I knew everything about the team. I had all the pictures on the walls, all the autographs, because after games, I used to wait for autographs and you know, they meant the world to me to have my walls. And you know, that was just the, the love you had for that team. But uh, as well with the, the two centre halves, I used to be Gary Palace. He was my he was my idol growing up because he was a centre back, and you know I've, 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 I've Tony Mowbray's been my manager, so I've met these people in person. I named a horse after Archie Stevens, which again, <laughs> do you know what I mean? I'm meeting these people. I know Archie, he lives up in up Stokesley where now, and I, and I know him. But I meet these legends, like when I was a young kid growing up. Now when I'm meeting them and speaking to them, it's it's really really surreal. But that team then was fantastic. But I remember you winning the title that year. I remember it. We can't let that go past without that's talking when, about that. That's when three got promoted, if I remember rightly. Sorry. Three got promoted and the rest were promotions. Is that right? Sorry, we won the title, not yeah, us. Sorry. Yeah, we won the title. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. We won the title. Is that right, though? I'm sure three went up and there was four promo four playoffs. I think, it, you think you're right. We, we only looked at the top. Yeah. <laughs> the horse named after Archie Stevens. We might have some racing fans listening. Just, uh, just tell us about that. Were you, were you a big racing man, were you? Yeah, well, I, we had a syndicate, me and a few few friends, and uh, the other friend who was in it called Steve Seed. He was He's a massive Middlesbrough fan, huge Middlesbrough fan. Um, so it was a joint effort, I'd say, between me and him to aim at Archie Stevens. Profitable. He used, to, Profitable. He, used to, he used to stand, it wasn't a great one, to be honest. <laughs> he used to stand in the whole gate shouting Archie, Archie Stevens, so we named it after him. I guess at that time under under Bruce Rioch, you went on to win back-to-back -back promotions at Middlesbrough. How much did the success of that team, not just the fact they were your idols, but the fact they were winning and getting promoted, how much did that fuel yeah, your fire? That, that's the buzz you get when you're a young kid and, and you're, uh, your local team's winning games and climbing the leagues. There's, there's nothing better. Um, and they kept on doing that constantly. I mean, the team, a few um, a few players changed, but it was um, it was like the, the basic of that squad stayed all the way through. And Colin Cooper coming, England international, Gary Palace, sort of Man United. So a lot of them really fulfilled the potential. Let's move it on from you kicking around in the street then to, to playing for Nunthorpe Athletic. Tell us about that and the uh, the early, I guess, organised football that you're involved in. Yeah, well, I didn't even know I didn't even know they had teams then because I must have been about ten year old. And now they're, they're, they're playing a four year old, so I was ten year old. Um, and I remember two of my friends who used to play on the street. I said, "Come and come and join this team we've joined." So um, I went up, walked up there, and they were a year above me. So I had to play with a year above because I didn't have a a younger team, so I always played a year above myself, not because of I was good, just by chance, really. But I tell you what, it didn't have to bring you on because you're playing against more physical players. And yeah, went went to Nunthorpe and we used to get trounced every week, and then we started winning, and then we started winning and winning and winning. And then that was a that was a really good time. That just you you enjoyed football, you absolutely adored it. You know your your parents are there trying to make money for the tracksuits and stuff, and selling teas and selling oranges and bovrils and all that. It still happens now. I, 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 my son's team, we have it, and I do, me and Spike, Graham Lee, um, do the coaching for our under-9 team. So we really enjoy that. I can't do it at the minute, but it's great times, to be honest with you, but as a childhood, as a child, child, uh, as a kid growing up, playing for that local team then, going on and on and on was, was brilliant. Just going on, um, despite your affiliations with... Middlesbrough, Wikipedia says that that was your first professional club. Now, that's not quite right, is it? Well, I started off at Middlesbrough um, and they'd sometimes ring you on a Friday night saying, can you play on a Saturday? And my dad was like, no, he's already agreed to play with his his local team. So we didn't want to let my local team down and would give our word to it that we'd play for. So then different clubs come and watch the team. I'd moved to Martin at this time, which was a really successful team. Uh, dropped down on my own age. And then other scouts come and watch it, Man United, Forest, Leeds, you name it. Every scout was coming to them games. And you so, obviously got scouted by Leeds, it's how you ended up there. Yeah, I got scouted by Leeds. I went there lots on trial. Um, but absolutely loved it. I had an affiliation with the club the first time I went down, everyone was friendly. 
and I, and I, and I got stuck in and that's what you've got to do especially at a young age you've got to go there with a full of enthusiasm and look to look to get in amongst it I know I know it's a source of frustration that you didn't win a great deal in your professional career and you talk about the League Cup but you often forget about the FA Youth Cup which was, is winning that is some achievement yeah, as well normally when you win the FA Youth Cup the brunt of them players are going to go and have successful careers that doesn't really happen now because of, of the, the, the foreigners that have been bought into the Premier League but a lot of the uh, younger players you win the FA Youth Cup you've got a hot bed of talent coming through and we we had that in that team um, there's a lot of good players came through like Harry Kuehl Paul Robinson uh, Alan Smith Alan Mabry um, and, and, and others who went on to do well Lee Matthews who's, who's, who's now an agent but a lot of that team went on to, to play um, Ian Hart and Warren Feeney are two ex-Bournemouth players yeah. um, obviously we're trying to keep this as local as we can I know you played with Ian did you ever cross paths with Warren as well who's Stephen yeah. Purchase's brother yeah Feeney was the uh, year below me yeah, below me so <laughs> I had a good relationship with Fino. he's a good lad he, you know what Fino is like he's he's a heart and soul of everything really he, he texted me before I was was coming down here and just said it's a fantastic club um, so yeah I've got his number and I'd, I've texted him the, the other time Hearty I've we have had a few holidays with Hearty to different destinations but he was an unbelievable left back unbelievable at Leeds I remember one friendly game he's got a hat-trick of free kicks against Huddersfield in a pre-season friendly but what a player, what a left foot he had. He was brilliant when he came here as well, wasn't he? Mm. You could do with a few set pieces here, couldn't you, at the minute? On his yeah, left foot. I could do with that left foot. <laughs> Just talking about another Hart who was pivotal in your early career, Paul Hart, I know that you said he was quite a, quite a scary man. And Just tell us a bit of story about how he told you you have to improve your heading. Yeah, well, I remember, so we went to the, we went to the Dallas Cup and I was a 15-year-old kid playing, I'd say, in an under-19 tournament. It was my first tournament. And I was really nervous going to it. Like the training session before, I was like, oh my God. And I remember I couldn't pass the ball. Come at the games, I was absolutely perfect. And I played really, really well against Vasto da Gama and Santos and Sao Paulo. And I was I was very good. So anyway, we go back to to England and they offer me a pro contract at the age of 15. They say, right, when you're 17, you're going to turn pro. Brilliant. All, all agreed. So then I go to Leeds. I've signed my, my YTS, about to sign my pro form, Paul R pulls me in. He says, uh, call me Ghost. He said, Ghost, that's because I spewed up when we were doing some runs <laughs> at the early days. So he calls me, he said, Ghost. He said, uh, you, you might not be getting this pro contract. I went, oh, why is that? He went, because you can't head the ball. I went, I, I, I can, Paul, I, I can do it. He said, you're not doing it at the minute, you're not aggressive enough to do it. So he had me out afternoons, practice, 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 just to become better in the air. Because the centre half partner I was playing against, playing with, called Damien Lynch, was smaller than me, but he was unbelievable in the air. And I was watching him in some of the games, I was going, How are you doing that? Then one game of me just went boom, just clicked. So it was the aggression, it was the timing, it was the height I was jumping at, and it all just fell into place. I ended up getting the, the pro contract because of Paul getting me out there on afternoons, doing it and doing it. And, and practice. I know it's difficult now with the all the stuff going on about heading and stuff, but it's a massive part of the game. So I don't know what they're going to do with it in the in the long run. You must have read my next question. It's a very serious and a very top topical subject at the moment in light of Gordon McQueen's recent yeah. dementia diagnosis and other players. And now there are some age groups at this football club where heading is banned already in yeah. some of the younger age groups. Just give us your. You've got a young son who plays football. What's your take on all of yeah, that? Yeah, I think in 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 younger ages it has to be the can't start heading balls or if they're going to head something head a really light ball like the the um, the green ball you know when you're playing on the inside and indoors you can get them balls which you can you can head but I think it's a a lot different now and you know it, how much evidence is there in, into this I think we need to look harder and, and look firmer to see what it really is with it it, it hasn't obviously been been good in the past but unfortunately it's part of the game so they'll have to come up with something looking forward at 18 you had played in the Premier League you played in the UEFA Cup you played in the League Cup played in the FA Cup you'd scored in the Premier League and you'd been sent off in the FA Cup what kept you? what, what? what kept you? <laughs> I don't know. it's not a bad question <laughs> it's not a bad question no, I, uh, to be fair 18 year old playing in the Premier League and I think I was did you say UEFA Cup there? I think I made my England debut at 18 as well didn't I? So yeah, listen, I don't think there's many players who, who do that at this age now. But you need a manager who's got who's got bottle to put you in there. 
and, and David O'Leary done that. George Graham was a manager before. He always had us training amongst the first team and we always used to try and make an impression. But when David O'Leary came in, he put a number in the first team and, you know, it takes a manager with bottle to, to do that. So if it wasn't for him, I might not have got my chance. Just staying on that theme of, of being a teenager and being at the top level, your England debut, as you mentioned, was against Bulgaria in 1999. Kevin Keegan chucked you in. Gareth Southgate, of course, at the minute, is not averse to throwing young guys in. He played in that game, I think yeah, I'm right saying. But it, was, it wasn't it was really the dumb thing back then to throw teenagers in for England, was it? No, well, especially in a qualifier, a uh, European qualifier. But Kevin Keegan had been watching me that season and he was pleased with what he'd seen. I was high in confidence. I was playing some good football, to be honest with you. So looking back now, I, I think I deserved my, my chance at that age because, in my view, I was was good enough maybe not on the on the outside it might look not look I was the most confident but on the inside I was had a, a real ambition and I was resolute and I knew what I wanted as part of that Leeds team I mean it was a good team you obviously spent a bit of money you know you, you've spoken very highly about Rio Ferdinand who of course was yeah. was here as well as a, a young player did you expect with the players you had to have the amount of success that you had with the Champions League well, runs and UEFA Cup and it's a success there was no success because we didn't win a trophy all right, we got the Champions League semi-final, the UEFA Cup semi-final, but we didn't win the thing. So you can you can you can say all you want, but for me that's not success. Success is winning trophies. Okay, we had a good run in it. We had a few positive seasons, and you know if, I can imagine being a Leeds fan at that time because our team was just flamboyant. It was aggressive. We had a lot of young kids coming through together, and it was more like playing with your friends, to be honest with you. Because I'd I'd, come, I'd been brought up with them all through the youth ranks, and then we started to buy Rio and. Robbie Fowler, Robbie Keane, we buy it. they're all English, young, hungry players. So you can imagine, you can imagine the banter in the dressing room. It was unbe- it was an unbelievable time to be honest with you. Um, but that was the one thing we didn't win anything, so you can't be a, you can't be a great team. I suppose you know, the trophies is the the ultimate marker. Neil and I, when we were looking through the some of the results of that Champions League campaign, you reached the semis in in 2000, 2001. You came through groups that included Barcelona, AC Milan, and Real Madrid. Yeah. Um, you got through those groups. Your last game was against Lazio. Um, I guess for you though, the, the the injury that robbed you of the chance of playing in the quarters and the semis is that is that one of the things you look back on with frustration? It's one of them things, isn't it? You, you, you get, you have to get over it. It's happened in my, in my career many times, so you, you you become used to it. It's not nice, but you move on, you get on with it. Uh, and when you do get injured, you think to yourself, "I'll come back fitter, faster, and stronger." It's difficult when you get older, but when you're younger, you have that bit between your teeth. But like I said, them them runs at that time were unbelievable. The nights at Ellen Road, the atmosphere from the fans. What a stadium that is when it's full, by the way. And I'm gutted this year that they haven't had their fans there. Because I'm telling you now, that player should be rocking with the football they play as well. How exciting they are! It'd be jam packed every week. You talk about the uh, the team, the league, great Leeds team being assembled, but it was also dismantled eventually as well. And in January 2003, you were sold to Newcastle to to raise funds for the club. That must have been quite an unsettling period in your career, because I understand. Terry Venables also left the club because he disagreed so much with your your sale. Yeah. Um... I think it was a tough, tough period in the in, in the club's history, really. And I think Peter Ridsdale did unbelievable for that football club, but we just pushed that a little too far, and we finished fourth that year when we need to finish third. It was top three then that got Champions League. We finished fourth in the Premier League. I think we missed out by a, a point or something, but we chased the dream. That's what the club did: chase the dream. Okay, we got so far, but we didn't reach the pinnacle. We didn't reach the top of the mountain, and then it just slowly folded I think we sold Rio that year for 30 million to Man United I went in the January transfer window and Newcastle and I didn't want to leave I wanted to stay I think Harry Kew was sold Lee Boyer Fowler Kane and everyone was gone and then the year after Leeds were Leeds were really struggling but it was a time where I remember getting told in the gym that they've accepted a bid for you off my age and I went listen I don't want to go I'm out of here I love playing for Leeds and I love the, the, the club because I did have I did actually when don't people say oh, I love the club and all that I actually did, because I'd been there since one so young, signed there at 14 year old and, and come all the way through. I loved it. Um, but I was told, listen, you've got to leave or the club might go further down and, and lose a lot more money. And, you know, I didn't want to see that happen. Has that been a lesson, do you think, as footballers? I know everything's changed and the money's changed mm. infinitely since then, but of Leeds and what happened and how much they threw at it to chase the dream and how it went wrong from there. I think of Portsmouth down the road did something very similar. Yeah. Is that a lesson for other clubs to what happened? Yeah, happens? I think so. Yeah, You can't on banking on getting somewhere. You can't... Basically, sometimes it's a flick of a coin um, and, and we try to do that. 
that was the biggest thing. And look where they ended up. They ended up in League One. And now they're back in the Premier League after what twenty odd year. So it's a thing that you shouldn't you shouldn't do. Okay, we chased it. As a manager as well, now you would have you would have learned from that experience when you were a player. So when a player, you know, you you call a player into your office and say wherever you are, I don't know, you know, we've got to sell you to balance the books or all that. And he might turn around and say, well, I don't want to go. So mm. you've been on that on the other end of that. Yeah, I, I think my view in, in working with players is just be honest with them, whether they like it or not. They'll appreciate it later on and say, well, at least he told me the truth and at least he was honest with me. I don't want to talk a load of bull to players when they come to my office. I'd rather just tell them, tell them straight. At the minute, I haven't told players they need to leave. When I was at Middlesbrough, I was at Bournemouth. So that's that's been okay. I've had to tell players why they're not playing, um, and they've got to respect that. And sometimes it's not easy. But if you're honest with them and, and tell them the truth why they're not playing, they should understand. So T sider moving to Geordie Land. What was that like? How did that go? Down? <laughs> it was all right. To be fair, to be fair, the uh, when I went to Newcastle, I played probably played my best footballer when I was at Newcastle. I had a manager in Bobby Robson who just was off the scale and giving you confidence. Just a man manager, just absolutely first class how he dealt with you. In okay times, um, he did give you a rollicking, but you'd come out of the office after g him giving you the rollicking, you'd still feel 10 foot tall because of what he said you're after the rollicking. <laughs> um, but he was very honest, so enthusiastic on the training pitch, enthusiastic with all his players, and it was one of them managers you really want to you wanna play for, want to work as hard as you can for. I remember at dinner times, we all used to sit, we all used to have to wait for him to eat, so he'd have to be the first one up. So we'd all wait, and then me, Keen Dyer, Bellamy, Shearer, Gary Speed, all sat there, at the table, like a bit like out of an Oliver scene. <laughs> and he says, right, boys, you can eat. So then we'd go, go up and eat, and then we'd have to wait until he'd finished. So when he finished, he could say we'd all go. So again, we've all dead quick. Bobby was a bit like slow eating his food. Um, and then he'd say, right, you can go, boys. All off, and so. <laughs> you couldn't do that now. Hundred percent. We're on here then. No? <laughs> you couldn't do it now. No chance of doing that now. Right, lads, stay there until I've eaten. They'll be like, yeah. Steve right. Fletcher, sit there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They'd have no chance. You've spoken about that atmosphere at uh, Ellen Road, but everybody knows that St James's Park is is as good as better, worse. Yeah, I wouldn't say it is. It is. It is good. But they had fifty six thousand in there. When they do raw, they don't half raw, and they've got massive expectations at that football club. Huge expectations, and we were in the Champions League at the time as well. Uh, we were up there fighting for, I wouldn't say we they never really looked like winning the league, but we were up there third, fourth, giving it a go. And on our day, we were a, a really, really good team. But that is a hotbed, that is a goldfish ball to live in. You talk about different areas in the country and that, wow, that's one city, one team. One city, one team, but like Leeds. So I'm used to living in that pressure situation where it's a goldfish ball environment and the fans want you to do so well and they're passionate. And every, every time I see a Newcastle fan, they say, oh, you're the best centre half we've seen in Newcastle. Blah blah. I'm like, well, all right, <laughs> I don't hear any more of that. <laughs> but no, the fans were brilliant with me. From one city, one team to to one city, two major teams. Anyway, because from Newcastle to to Real Madrid, um, just just talk us through the background of of how it all came about and how much of a surprise it was when they were interested. Yeah, they were, we were playing in the UEFA Cup that season um, against a lot of big teams, and I knew my agent told me he said they're, they're watching you, they're keeping an eye on you. Um, and that season I got injured against Chelsea, so I thought that was the end of that. And then anyway, they bought Walter Samuel, Real Madrid. He was, he was playing for Inter Milan at the time, Argentinian defender, top draw he was. I said, well, that's, that's definitely not happening. So anyway, I, got a, I get a phone call off my agent and I'm walking down the steps in Whitby, the famous steps in Whitby, and I'm walking down at the time and, I'm, and he rang me and said, Real Madrid are going to bid for you tomorrow. What do you want to do? Well, I nearly, I nearly fell down the steps. I said, well, what do you, what do you think I want to do? I want to, I want to go, I want to play for the biggest team in the world. I said, right, well, they're going to bid with you. They're going to bid for you. There might be a few problems Newcastle's end. They might want a bit more money. I said, well, let's see. But if the bid's right, then I 100% want to go. But then, of course, when you did go, um, you didn't play for 12 months. Um, yeah. You got injured. You tried to come back. You yeah. got injured again. I mean, yeah. that is as, as tough as it gets, isn't it, as a player? And not it's only in a, 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 a new club, the oh, biggest club. Yeah, It's an absolute nightmare. And like when players get injured here and now at Middlesbrough and I was there, it's heartbreaking to be honest with you because I'm at the biggest club in the world playing my best football that I've played and I couldn't do it being there on the big stage what you've dreamed of as a kid and it was I look back now and I think whatever I couldn't do nothing about it but I wish my body had st stood up to it I come back too early and probably that was my eagerness 
of coming back too early. I want to get back. I want to get back, and my th my thigh would rip again. Uh, at, at times, I don't think I was diagnosed right because I was coming back too early. So obviously, I wasn't get I wasn't getting diagnosed right because I was coming back too early. Um, and yeah, it took me a year to make my debut. And you, I'm walking to the training ground every day. And I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed to to look at other players and stuff. And it was a really tough time then. You don't realise how tough it was, but it was tough living there on my own. And I did find it difficult, but you have to get on with it. You have to you have to deal with it and. I, I try to learn the language and I try to fit in with as many players as I could because I thought that was not really important of me learning, trying to fit into their culture, learning the language, doing what they do because I wasn't playing. So I couldn't build relationships on the pitch. I had to try and do it off the pitch. And when I ever saw the players, try and make little mistakes. So you have a little conversation with them, you have a little laugh and just try to be affable with them all. Uh, and it worked, to be honest with you. I had a good relationship with them all. They realised the situation I was in and they realised how hard I was working to try and get back. And that was the biggest thing for me. And I was proud when I got back because it was difficult. Obviously, Michael Owen, I think I'm right in saying, joined the week before you. Is that right? Yeah, he was there. Yeah. Was he there? Yeah, yeah. I think very, there. very similar yeah. time. Anyway, David yeah. Beckham obviously was already there. Yeah. How good were they for you or, or, or not in the case? And, and was there that, I guess you say, getting on with all the lads, was there a bit of you that's the default of hanging around with the English lads, that a bit of a safety net? Nah, well, I wasn't like that. I was, I'd probably hang about with the, the uh, foreign lads a bit more. Uh, David was top man over there. Michael was, uh, and I still speak to Michael now, but very much. Um, how do I, how do I, how do I say it? They're not as outgoing as me. Do you know what I mean? They're not, they're not as outgoing. And I'd have conversations with someone because I'm not bothered about making mistakes. To be honest with you, and I wanted to get to know them, where they could build relationships on a pitch. So I'd do it a, a different way. Um, but yeah, they were they were fantastic. For three English lads to be at Real Madrid at that time was was unbelievable. But I had good relationship with the Brazilian lads. Uh, who were fantastic for me, especially uh, being injured at that time. Um, Michel Salgado was was also very good, but I can't speak highly enough of, of that bunch, of that world class bunch. They were so easy to get on with, and there was no big egos because they all know they're good players, but they don't show it, and they haven't got egos. They just get on with the work and do it. I like I like a glass of Rioja, and I sometimes have a glass of Coke as well. Mm. Is it true that they put the two together in Spain? Uh, yeah, yeah, they do. It's called Cali Macho. I still drink it now. I still drink it now. And I named another horse called Barolo Top. Was he any better than the other one? He wasn't too good, neither. <laughs> so, what's that taste like? Nice, have a taste of it. It's quite it's nice, you know. Seriously, when I say to people, have a go of it, they're like, What, what sort of measures are we talking here? Not a full you're, large no, you're glass. Talking, you're probably half, you're half. He's <laughs> talking not half, of, no, not half a bottle of wine, so <laughs> half a glass of wine, bit of coke, bit, bit of ice in there as well. It's nice. Have you seen Neil's measures? It would be half a bottle. <laughs> yeah. And what, 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 what would you have eaten with that? What, what could you make out there? Did you learn to cook Spanish well, and can, stuff? Yeah, I can cook. I wouldn't say I'm a great cook and paella like, but I can cook. Um, I think it's important when you when I've moved around so many times in my life that it's important I cook. I don't just see my wife cooking all the time. I enjoy cooking, so it's good for me as well. Every young footballer's dream would be to play and make their debut for Real Madrid. And you would be talking about this one, the famous <laughs> debut. <laughs> How did I know? <laughs> Have you ever been in an interview about Real Madrid where it hasn't been asked? No, but all I say, what was your Real Madrid debut like? <laughs> exactly. That's the, that's the point I'm making. I would have given one second yeah. to play one professional football match. Yeah. So, okay, talk us through it. Yeah, I remember a couple of days before, one day Luxembourg said to me, you're going to play, so get your parents over. So parents came to the game. Night before a game, it was always in a hotel. So we'd always go to the local hotel. And before every single game, whether it be a practice game, friendly game, pre-season, league game, whatever game, I'm always nervous the night before. And I'm talking like myself. Like I'm in bed and I wake up in the morning like, and your belly starts. And this is a night of my belly starts and I'm rumbling and I've just got butterflies all day in my belly. As soon as I get the game, I'm absolutely perfect. As soon as I cross the right line, not a problem. I think I'm the, I'm the best player there. Then the next minute I just see this ball flying towards me. I think, go on, deflect it away. Obviously, I'd been out for a, a year, didn't have my, didn't know where I was on the pitch, deflecting the goal. And I think to myself, oh my God, against Atletico Bilbao, what, 100,000 people in the stadium. I just wanted the ground to wake me up. I remember one of the players picking me up off the floor, Pavon, come and pick me up, he said, come on, let's get going. Anyway, start playing again, got a yellow card, should have been a red. It was a horrendous tackle because I'm that up for it, charged, whatever. Should have been a red. Second half comes anyway. I remember, 
uh, wanted the forward knocking the ball past me. And I've just body checked him and sprinted after it and got the ball. I thought, good bit of defending that. Keep on going, keep on going. The next minute, the referee charges over. And they're quite aggressive, the Spanish referees. And I'm, I'm seeing him what marching towards him. I'm like, oh no, he's going to get the yellow out and take him slow motion. She just went, boom, slow, yellow card. And then be like Roberto Carlos, Rabinho, all of them players surrounding the referee. It's went off. So I remember walking off and the whole stadium applauded me off the pitch. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. They all, like, the whole stadium applauded me off. I was like, wow. Wowzers. And then uh, we were getting beat 2 1 at the time. We actually won it, I think, 4 2 in the end. So that was that was good that we won. And after the game, I'm lying there in the, in the, in the dressing room and Ronaldo comes and he says, How are you? I said, <laughs> As you can imagine, obviously devastated. He went, "Don't worry about it. You're fit. Your legs fine. You can you can play on. You can you can kick on from here." So yeah, from going from a horrendous minute to making your debut, we're getting applauded off by all them fans. Special. So you um, you obviously learned to to uh, speak some Spanish. So did you pick up all the local news, all the national newspapers the next day? And did you read the Spanish? What they were saying about you? Yeah, I try to read. I try to read bits. Obviously, it, it was difficult to understand. But my mum still got all the cuttings from what the English press was saying about me. <laughs> uh, and that was quite funny, to be fair, when you when you look back. But I did try to read all the, the, the newspapers, periodicals they're called. Um, so I tried to read all them. And you just try to improve. Got a bit of stick. What if a duck's back? I'd be out for a year. Talking about every schoolboy's dream to play for Real Madrid, it's every schoolboy's dream to just to get an autograph of someone like Ronaldo, Figo, Zidane, Roberto Carlos and Raul and you you played with them all, you've spoken about how good Ronaldo was, I think the Brazilian lads were were really good with you as well, just expand on that. Yeah, they were they were top draw, like um, after games and that we used to go to restaurants and sit, even if their family were there, we used to go around and, and, and just sit with them and just have a, have a good time, if my friends came over we'd go to Ronaldo's house, so you can imagine my friends are coming over from England, like 22 year old lads who are maybe labouring or whatever or joiners or welders and the next minute they're in Ronaldo's house playing pool with him <laughs> do you know you can picture them you can just picture it can't you but the Brazilians are that like likeable and they're just normal all I want to do is have a good time but on the pitch they're, they're a different they're a different ball game they're like at it, off the pitch they just want to enjoy themselves and they really helped to be honest with you because I didn't I wasn't that that lonely I'd go on there have, have tea or whatever and enjoy it. Um, the mental side of going to a dressing room like that, did you have any issue, I know you had your injury issues, believing you were good enough to be in that dressing room? You, you know, you're just a lad from Middlesbrough, you know, that's what you'd say, I'm sure, yeah. that you deserve to be in that dressing room with those kind of world-class players. You have to get yourself mentally to the no, right I, level. I, like I say, on the inside, or on the outside, I didn't look so like that, but on the inside, I had a burning desire to be the best defender in the world. And I believed 100% that I... I was I was right for that club and and right to play with them players. Um, you have to believe in yourself. You have to have that inner drive. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't really I couldn't do it because of of the injury at the time. But yeah, I definitely believed in myself. No doubt about that. Yeah, you went on to play with a young Sergio Ramos at uh, centre back, didn't you? Who was just coming through, I think, as a, as a teenager. Then did you did you have a little inkling then that he'd be as as yeah. good as he turned yeah. out? Sergio came on the second season from Seville. Um, and I knew he was going to be a, a special player. He was a very more individual defender as a more team defender, uh, but he was playing right back, centre back, he even played centre midfield against Rosenberg. But you could see he was going to be an outstanding outstanding talent. And what's he got? Something like 182 caps for Spain, won a World Cup, two European Cups, two European Championships, four Champions Leagues, the Ligas. Oh, he's an unbelievable. He's one of their biggest ever players. Then, of course, from Real Madrid, a loan move back to Middlesbrough, mm. which I think I'm right in saying came as a little bit of a, a surprise when it all happened, didn't it? Yeah, it was a surprise because I'd done the full pre-season and I was feeling fit and I was feeling really good looking forward to to cementing my place in the team and Fab Fabio Capello took over that that, uh, that season. I remember just walking past Fabio in the corridor and he went to me, oh, Franco Baldini wants to see you. I said, well, okay. Walk, walked to see Franco and he went, no, Jonathan, we want you to go on loan this season. Middlesbrough want to take you on, on Newcastle. And I went, right, okay. I didn't see that one coming because I just walked past the manager about five seconds later, he didn't mention a word to me. Obviously, they do it different in Spain. So, yeah, ended up going to my, my boyhood team, fulfilling an ambition. Um, started playing again. I played most of the games that season and got back in England squad. 
I don't know if it was specifically in that period, but you, you mentioned embarrassment earlier on about the injury issues. And I guess that you said in the context of being at Real Madrid and not being able to play for a year. Also, hearing you speak before about embarrassment in a stadium sometimes, if you had a little bit of a problem in a game and you felt like you had to come off. Yeah. Was that was that Middlesbrough sometimes when you thought you were you were going to get stick from the fans, so you it, played it, on it, just it, to avoid it? It's not so much the stick, it's like that. You see, you go down right and you go, oh, not again. Do you know what I mean? So I used to try and stay out at half time, even if I'd tweaked a calf or a... Hamstring, I just try to get through the game and I've done it multiple occasions. Listen, it, I wouldn't advise any other player to do it. I just couldn't handle coming off. So I had to come off at half time so I didn't get that. Oh, it's just sticking my mind. <laughs> so you just think, right, get through it. It's selfish of me, to be honest with you, because if something had happened, I might not have been able to, to sprint back. It's not the right thing to do, but I did it. Another chapter unfolded when you moved to Spurs are playing under Harry Redknapp. Just tell us about your time with him. Yeah, well, it's, it started under one day Ramos bought me from Middlesbrough. Um, I had 18 months at Middlesbrough, um, and and they bought me in. We won we won the League Cup. I had a good team playing in the UEFA Cup, and I want to just keep on stepping up that level. My worst decision I ever made in football, so we've, we've missed this, was signing for Middlesbrough full time. So when I went on loan from Real Madrid to Middlesbrough, I should have just went on loan for the year. Uh, and then gone back to Real Madrid and done it again. I had another year on my contract. But in the middle of that year, I decided I'll stay permanently. So I signed a four-year contract at Middlesbrough. I should never have done that. I should have gone back to the biggest team in the world and, and gone again, but I didn't. It's a massive regret of mine. Have we also missed that you could have signed a five-year contract with Real Madrid and went for four? Yeah, that was doing, that was the doing my medical. Yeah, that was my medical. And I remember the doctor saying, listen, John, if you have a a slight back issue that we that we need to look at. Um, we'll have to see what the chairman wants to do, Florentino Perez. So I heard him on the phone, and I'm thinking to myself, oh, God, they were speaking a load of Spanish. And then the doctor come off the phone and went to me. He said, right, Jonathan. The chairman said, instead of giving you a five-year contract, we'll give you a four-year contract. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, happy days, happy days. You signed and ran. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just moving back to um, Spurs, you obviously scored the goal in the League Cup final against a really good Chelsea team and it, it comes across about how much of a winner winner you are um, and that was the only trophy you won in your yeah. professional career How where where does that rank in your career would it be top because of your yeah, because attitude you, you, you win something um, and I always want to win trophies and, and to win a trophy was, was unreal but when you don't you always look back and you think mm, unfulfilled you know what I mean and obviously think you can't be in the right place at the right time at, in, in different occasions uh, but yeah, to score that goal and to, to overcome my injuries was like the feeling when I scored that goal was like, oh my God, I've done it. If you know what I mean, I've got back from all them injury issues and and, and got back there to score the goal. And I remember all my family were there at the time and to do that was just special. They haven't won a trophy since, which is a shame. Now obviously, you've um, played under Harry Redknapp and you've taken his recommendation for Shea Fred. Just tell us what he was like mm. to play under. Yeah. Unbelievable. It's similar to Bobby Robson and Howard manager, just man management. Each day, just feel you, feed you full of confidence, tell you how good you've been playing. Could go mental as well, by the way. I've seen Harry lose his temper on a few occasions with different players, and it's like, oh, it's one of them. But he was a brilliant manager. And I, and I think I was, I was. I was really good for him when he didn't get the England job that time. I thought he was nailed on to get it, and, and Roy Hodgson got it. it. Was equally a very good manager, but I was just good for Harry that he didn't he didn't get that opportunity. But another great person, and when I'm down here, I always speak to him. He's been brilliant for me. From one ex Bournemouth manager to another, when Tony Pulis at Stoke and mm. spoke to Asmir Begovic about playing under Tony Pulis and asked him whether he ever got the hair dryer treatment, and he said, "Who didn't? Did you?" Yeah. Yeah, I got a couple of times. Well, he, <laughs> he just brought me off one after 34 minutes, so that just said it all, really. I, I, he, played me, he was playing me right back. And he said to me before the game, he said, listen, John, I need you to do a job, play right back for me, because he liked some man's big centre-half playing right back. I said, yeah, no problem, Gaffer, I'll do it. Um, so we played Wolves, and I went up against Matt Jarvis, who was, goes right where he goes right side, he goes left side, and I'm thinking, right, I'm right on here. Really revved up before the game. Ball goes into him, I think he's getting taken out, try to take him out. Got a yellow card. Next time it comes in the box, he texts me on, give away a penalty. So I'm, I haven't got sent off, so I'm lucky. Anyway, they missed the penalty. And all I see is this number 39 number. And all I see is the gaffer with his cap on. He's gone, come here, come here, John. 
So I'm, I'm, I'm walking off. I just say, as I go past him, I say, tell you what, Gaff, that was the right decision you just made there. <laughs> <laughs> he tells that story. Now, actually, it was the best decision. I was getting turned left, right and centre. Oh, yeah. I was getting absolutely annihilated. It was the right decision for the team. We end up winning the game, so no problem. But I learned so much from him because I thought I'd go to Stoke. I was the bees knees, whatever, just left spares. I learned so much from him in de defensive organisation and and different and different things you can do. And he's a type of manager who's really, really hands on. Um, and what a job he did at, at Stoke, um, getting from the lower leagues and taking them up. Brilliant. We'll come on to your management management career in depth later. But has any player had the hairdryer treatment from you as a manager? Yeah, a few. Yeah, you've got one, haven't you? Yeah. There's a time and there's a place, but don't do it all the time. That's, uh, you can't do it all the time because it'll just go through one and out the other. But yeah, you have to do sometimes. There's a time and a place. So um, back to Borough, and then you retired. Was that injury or lack of prospects or keeping yeah, into the, management? The, the, last, the last year I didn't really play, and I was more of a senior player in that dressing room trying to help a few of the, the players, and I'd been in through that experience. Um, but it was a year that the, the team went up under Aitor Karanka. It was it was a really good manager for Middlesbrough at the time and had a lot of success. Um, he built a really good squad, a strong foundation. He upped the standards at that football club when I was there. Um, and he did a, a, a fantastic job. Just before we come on to uh, your post-playing career, uh, we, I've been in the press room, Neil. I don't know if you have, when Harry Redknapp has launched a member of the media as well. Uh, mm -hmm. about a certain question. This is at Portsmouth back in the day and it wasn't a, wasn't a good room to be in, let me tell you about that. So that, and that was, and the cameras are off at this point, by the way, but that was a fairly uh, hefty hair dryer treatment for the media, let alone for his players. W was that the, a different Harry Red Redknapp to the one we saw on the Sandbanks programme? Uh, I, I don't watch that trash, Neil. I'm too busy researching for Bournemouth mm -hmm. commentaries. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's come back then, Jonathan, to, to post-playing life. Um, how did you deal with that sudden lack of structure and routine and everything that a player has. That's exactly career. what you say there, routine and structure is the, the biggest thing I was used to from a 16 year old lad, knowing what I was doing, what time I'd have breakfast, what time dinner training, the whole shebang. And then it used to go evaporate. And you think to yourself, well, what am I going to do now? I'd done my B license in coaching and I got a phone call from Michael Edwards at Liverpool, who when he was at Spurs was head of analysis. And now I always used to spend time in the analysis department every single day me and him just just talking about football and watching clips on myself or watching different players so I'd always kept in contact with him and always had a relationship with him and he said what are you doing I said you know what I'm bored out my brains I've been retired three weeks <laughs> I've got nothing in the pipeline <laughs> so listen I'm open to, to whatever he said do you want to come and work for Liverpool do you want to be the, the uh, Spanish and Portuguese scout I went didn't even ask my wife I went yeah I said I'm all over it because I used to watch the Liga anyway on the telly, so I knew half the players anyway. So I was thinking, yeah, brilliant, I'm, I'm all in. And then did that with him for, say, eight months. Absolutely adored it. Absolutely adored it. I used to go over to, to watch the games in, in Spain. I'd say once every two weeks, maybe get four games in over a, the weekend period and watch a lot on, on the tech scouting, on, on television and stuff, and write reports and clip different games. And I absolutely adored it. Um, and I thought it was important for me looking at my long-term plan was to be a manager. But to get the recruitment in and to see what the recruitment teams do, I thought that was going to be an important part of my development and to learn something else, learn how to clip games, learn how to clip players, do lots of things for to try and bring this all to fruition later on in your in your career. Just what we call Michael Edwards is obviously a link between you and bringing Gary O'Neill here as well, wasn't he? Yeah, but I knew Gaz when he was at Middlesbrough. Yeah, of course. I, I played with Gaz, um, so obviously I made inquiries to Michael how was he doing in his, his coaching and he, uh, he's, he he spoke really highly of him so after doing that scouting for Liverpool for eight months or so then it was it was back to Middlesbrough and starting to work your way up through the, the coaching ranks by the academy and things yeah well Steve Ag uh, Steve Agnew brought me in because I talk right and got sacked so Agas rang me he said I want you I want to bring you in I said well Agas I'm at Liverpool at the minute really enjoying my role he said well you need to think what do you want to do long term I said well I want to be a manager that's that's my aim that's what I want and he said, well, you need to make a decision. So I'd give it, a, I'd say, a few days and I had a few conversations with, with Michael at, at Liverpool. And I said, listen, I, I want to be a manager at, at the end of the day. I want, to, I want to try and focus on my coaching and stuff. I've really enjoyed my time here. So then I went in as the first team coach at Middlesbrough. And that was like, wow. It was just, the, the situation the club found himself in, it looked like there was a, a bit of split in the camp with different different 
types in the in the changing room, which was difficult. And it was difficult for Aggers at the time. Um, so that was a real, real uh, learning experience for myself. I had three months there. Um, and then I went to the under 18s because a new manager came in and normally they, they bring the they bring their own staff in and other staff members leave. I went to the under 18s and started working there with Mark Tinkler. And again, so in this space of time, in a I'd say 18 month, I've worked for Liverpool in recruitment. I've worked at first team level and now I'm working at under 18. So I'm gaining different experience at different parts of different football clubs. So I thought that was invaluable for myself as well. And loved that working with the kids and, and really trying to improve them on a, on a daily basis. And obviously the manager that came in was was one Tony Pulis, who we've we've already mentioned. Um, obviously it didn't work out brilliantly for, for him ultimately there. He ended up departing as well. Can you remember the moment you were offered the job to be the manager of your hometown club, the club you've loved? Yeah. Can I take you back a bit though? Yeah, of course, Mr. please. Lord, yeah, yeah, sorry. So when, when Tony, so after our under-18s games, I go back home and I'll watch the first team game if I miss it just in case something ever happened. So if a new manager came in, he'd say, well, Jonathan Woodgate's in the background team. He must know what's going on in Middlesbrough. He's a brother lad. So I made sure I watched every single game. Tony Pulis walks in the door. Gary Monk gets a sack. Tony Pulis walks in the door. And I'm like, oh. First thing, who's he calling his office? Me. And he wants, he wants to know everything about the team for that season. So I'm obviously, I'm in probably in his office now for an hour just talking about football and at the end of that hour he says right you're in with me so it was easy as that it was like as easy as that the decision was made bang you're first team coach with me so then I look back and I think to myself if I hadn't watched all them games and prepared properly I wouldn't have been able to give him a proper view of what I knew about the players at that time so I'm just thank thank god I've done that work because I might not have been in that situation yeah, sorry, I completely deleted Gary Monk from the history of Middlesbrough there. So apologies for that to Gary, if you're listening. Um, <laughs> and obviously then ultimately the, the experience you built up under Tony and working as part of his team put you in a great position then to to get that job and, and yeah. to get that phone call from from Steve Gibson, presumably to say, we want you to be the manager. Yeah, I've done 18 months coaching with Tony and learning day, out, day in, day out with him. Um, he, he was absolutely first class for me. Um, different things that he did with me, learning made me end up doing all the meetings for the players day before games and one-on-one -on -one meetings and you know when you when you go into coaching I don't care who you are or what you are or what you've ever done in the game you go into the first meeting with them first team players you are nervous you're nervous so he said to me I think it was half an hour before the first meeting Tony says to me right he says you're doing this meeting so I'm like yeah inside I'm going oh my god trying to eat my food so I ended up doing the meetings for the rest of the season the Friday before the game obviously he takes the team meetings Saturday and, and stuff before games but I was doing like the presentations before games and really going through it with, with the full team so that uh, stood me in good stead for what I was going to do as a manager and when I went I, I put in an application for the job and I interviewed people from, from everywhere and when I come to do my interview it, I had to nail it and we're walking out of that room now I still remember the feeling that think to myself you've got a chance because you absolutely nailed it what was the fan reaction as a, as a hometown hero what was the fan reaction when you I got the job it, I think it was quite mixed I think it was mixed because they wanted someone with a lot of experience um, they wanted maybe someone who the club maybe couldn't couldn't afford at, at the time you know there was a lot of big names getting put in and sometimes fans have pipe dreams of who they think they can get well the reality is they can't get everyone in the world um, so I think it was split. When I got the job, when I spoke, I think then it was more 70-34 and they were with me to say I wanted to play. Um, so that was that was a real good feeling, getting a lot of the backing. But you know what it's like, you can't please everyone, can you? <laughs> and you do. And as I, as I carried on in my, my Middlesbrough reign, I did get a lot of abuse off, off a, a certain section of keyboard worries. As you say, my friends used to tell me you're getting... Absolutely annihilated. Personal stuff, you don't mind when it's about football. When it comes personal about yourself, then it's a different ball game. Amazing um, attention to detail there when you were the under 18s at Borough, but you did all your research on the first team as well. I know I was a, an early victim of your uh, attention to detail in an early interview I did with you when I said you probably don't know a great deal about Arnout Danjuma and uh, yeah. you knew a lot more than I did yeah, about yeah. Arnout Danjuma. Just, just explain sort of how important that is and uh, and. You know, you've got to know a lot about a lot of players. Yeah, well, of course you do, yeah. And when he said about Dan Juma, I knew everything about him because I'd watched him play. I'd watched him play and I'd 
I'd done my research and I think that's important. And even when I was even when I was doing the reports for for Liverpool or, or whatever, I've still got a record of them. So I knew, I knew exactly what I was doing. It's like recently about Cameron Carter Vickers. Uh, as soon as I got in, put an interim charge, he, he started playing because I, I knew what I was getting. I'd seen him, I'd worked on him in when we were in lockdown because I wanted to sign him at Middlesbrough. <laughs> so I knew what I was getting. So doing them extra little bits of work where you think you might not need, I didn't think I'd need them for this because I didn't think this opportunity would be there, but you do them bits of work and they'll come back and help you. So sometimes the harder you work, the luckier you get in, in situations like that. At Borough, you said that um, in a pre-season friendly, you wanted to play out from the back, but you had to abandon it quite early on, didn't you? Just yeah. explain why. Just because they were giving stupid goals away. A bit like what I've done here. We aren't playing out. Simple as that. Um, if you can work on it for a, a long period of time and you've got the players to do it, then okay. But sometimes you can cause yourself more harm than than good. And I, and I saw that of the of the recent games. You know, you can you can you can give goals away and give teams a leg up, like we've showed a couple of times this season. And I don't want that to happen. So I'll eliminate that. And we still played good football against Preston first half, against Bristol City first half, and, and different games we ain't played out. So people have this fascination about playing out. We've got to do it no matter what. I don't believe in it. If you've got the right, if you've got the perfect players, then yeah, and you're not conceding goals, then yeah. Fair enough, but if you are, then why are you doing it? Your exit from Borough, did it hurt more because it was your hometown club? And just tell us how it sort of came about. It absolutely killed me, wiped me out. I'm not going to lie, I got a phone call off Steve Gibson, I'd say seven o'clock, seven o'clock in the morning. He said, oh, where are you? I said, I'm on, the, I'm on the way in to work. He said, oh, can you come and see me when you get in? He said he'd be in about half eight. I said, yeah, so I told the coach that the chairman wants to see me, but I was still working on the game for the Saturday. In the back of my mind, I was thinking, this is this is not going to be good anyway. I went in there, he said, listen, Jonathan, I'm relieving of your, of your duties, not as a manager, but as a as a coach. And he said to me at the end, I still want you to stay at the football club. And I was like, I was, just, I was honestly, I was, I was devastated. I can't remember getting home, to be honest with you. I can't remember the journey home. Because all I'm thinking about is, wow, this is a whirlwind. This is an absolute whirlwind. Because it was only... Uh, a couple of weeks before, so a couple of weeks before lockdown, we had a meeting, me, Steve, and my coaching staff and the chief exec at a, a restaurant in Middlesbrough. And Steve went to me, this is before COVID, and this is before the Charlton game. Steve goes to me, if we get relegated, you're getting us promoted. Where you tin at, where you tin at, you get a bit of abuse, but we'll go again. And if we stay up, even better, we'll rebuild. And that was, to, for me to hear that, I was under pressure from the chairman. I was like, this is, this is unbelievable. This is, this is the backing that a chairman gives you. We beat Charlton on the Saturday, 1-0. We're going to lockdown. And it's like, well, no one knows what's happening. And it's, is the league going, is it not? Anyway, we've done a lot of preparation with the players to keep them fit. Anyway, Swansea game comes, we get B3-0. Um, and I think okay, we've been B three nil, but I've still, I've still got ten games to go. I think we're three three points above the 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 relegation zone at the time. So I think yeah, okay, I've got the chairman's backing, no problem. Anyway, the Tuesday comes and I get the, that phone call. I think, and then he makes the decision. I think it was a lot to do with what had happened in COVID, and the the club couldn't afford to to go down with them restrictions. Um, but yeah, I was absolutely. Devastated, it took me ages to get over there, to be honest with you. Ages, I had to get away. I had to get away at the time. The crazy thing is I couldn't get away because I couldn't find my passport. <laughs> <laughs> so it was an absolute nightmare anyway. I went away and, you know, I had to really think about things and what I wanted. Still had love for the football club. But yeah, it took a while to get over that. It was really difficult. That restaurant that you would have had that meeting in, it wouldn't have been Janino's by any chance, because I seem to remember Chris and I having a pizza in there and a few baby shams one night before a Middlesbrough game, was it? That was a ton time. <laughs> Did you ever venture into Janino's restaurant? Was it still there or was it gone? You never had one. Oh. In Middlesbrough Town Centre? I don't know what you're talking about, Neil. <laughs> I certainly don't drink baby sham. Yeah. <laughs> baby sham. Going back to those keyboard warriors, now, what seems to happen with a manager is that they all put the boot in when he's the manager and then when he leaves 
oh, they never should have got rid of him. He was the best man for the job. Yeah. Did you experience any of that with Middlesbrough fans that you know of? You don't strike me as the sort of man that's glued to uh, social no, media. I know you're on Instagram. I'm on but... Instagram, but that's about it. That's all, that's all I'm on. Um, but it's just not. It's just not nice. I mean, you don't mind if it's comments about the, the, the team and, and whatever, but when it comes personal, it's a bit, it's, it's ridiculous to be honest with you. It's not nice. And it's not nice for you. Your, 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 your mother to read at times and she had to turn the radio off a few times when people were ringing in but I suppose it, it's football but when people get personal it's different it becomes vindictive You headed off to Ibiza when you eventually found your passport didn't yeah. you for, for a month that was your real getaway Yeah yeah no it was I took me me the kids and my wife went um, I'm lucky enough to have a to place in Ibiza so we went we went there and just laid low and just you know they were in, they were in a bit of lockdown as well so but we had to wear masks and everything I needed, I had to get away, to be honest with you. I had to get away from that goldfish ball of Middlesbrough. Because <laughs> we were in lockdown, I couldn't go out. I couldn't I couldn't do a thing. So I needed to to get away. And if you ask any manager, when they get sacked, they need, just need to get away and think about something different. But it, it was tough. We've had a few days with the sun out here. So you've been able to sort of establish that Bournemouth knocks our beef into second place, does it, when the sun's out with I the beaches? Two day, do you know what, right, Chris? I've had two days since I've been here with sun. I can't, I can't believe it. Everyone tell it. Harry, Harry, Harry and, uh, and Tony keep on saying to me, oh, it's beautiful down here. <laughs> I've seen two days of sun. <laughs> it's like, the, it, it's, it's not as bad as the North East. Let me, let me tell you that. Like the lads yesterday were freezing out there with a bit of rain. <laughs> I was like, are you mad? This isn't cold. You want to come to Middlesbrough and see how cold it is? But the training ground at, at, at Darlow where Middlesbrough train, it's absolutely bolty. <laughs> You would see sometimes the lads in the training ground shots, but you can only see their eyes. They're that cold. They've got hats, they snoods, all up, all everything up. up. Yeah. yeah. I've got to say today, by the way, it's not Bournemouth. As we're recording this, there's wind and howling rain well, battering against the window. My kids have the t-shirts on now. <laughs> Down the beach. They'd have they wouldn't have the big jackets on. <laughs> in a 4-7 four, seven, uh, four, seven wind. Um, how much did the experience at Borough and it not ending the way you want make you even more determined to come back into the game as a manager? Yeah, hugely. Hugely. Um, but that's, that's, and to be fair, I wasn't that stupid to think you're going to get a second opportunity. Because I know it's so difficult to get a second opportunity in anything you really do in life. So sometimes you've got to go out your comfort zone and go and do a different, another challenge. Um, and that's what happened with with Jason. Jason rang me out of the blue. I know uh, Graham Jones went to Newcastle. I didn't even think about anything. And then uh, Jason rang me. Said, "Oh, what, what are you doing? Do you fancy coming down and, and taking Graham Jones's place?" And I was I was a bit covered. I was like, uh, "Yeah." He said, yeah, too right. I said, to learn from, from Jason, who'd been a successful part of Eddie Howe's backroom team, I thought it was a massive, massive pull to learn again, to go and uh, yeah, learn really more than, more than anything. And do you know what? Go outside your comfort zone. Come six hours away from your home. Coach different players you're not used to coaching. Go and speak to people you've never met before. Canteen staff, all staff around the building. Go out your comfort zone. And I think it was a, that was an important position to me moving forward of, of what I want to do. It shows that I wasn't scared to come to, down the other end of the country and, and do something different. It shows ambition. Um, and then, do you know what? When, when when that happened to Jason, when he when he when he got relieved of his duties, I was absolutely I was gutted because of he took a chance in me to 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 come down to Bournemouth and you know to try and to help him and to help Perch and, and and the team. And I was gutted that we couldn't fulfil that. But you know what football's like, it's a, it's an, a crew business at times. Just tell us what you can tell us about the the events of the, the, the weekend, if you like, and then leading up to the Sheffield Wednesday game. What were, How were you being given information about what, what was going on? Obviously, would have started after Sheffield Wednesday, I know. Uh, no, uh, when Jason rang me, he said, I said, yeah, I'll, I'll come down. I came down on a Sunday night. I remember coming down and, my, and uh, driving down six hours. I was thinking, wow, this is miles away. Uh, I hope it's going to be going to be worth it. I hope we can get to the, the playoffs or maybe get automatic, automatic promotion. I looked at the squad and the squad looked good. Get down. I, Jason meets me at the at the hotel. Gives me the keys. Helps me settle in with his, with his wife and stuff and really, really nice to see him. Next day I start training on the Monday and I'm just watching the session just as you do. It's my first day there and I just want to watch and observe and, and see what the players are like and it was all good. Get the game. I'm thinking... Phew. Good, good team we got out here when we go a goal behind we get one back the 90th minute but I remember saying to Jordan Rhodes I remember saying before the game saying make sure when you come on today you don't score I remember saying it 
and then thinking three days later, thinking, do you want you get a flashback in your mind? And I'm thinking, like, oh my God, he scores. That's a, and I, I remember the next morning, I remember I, I had missed loads of missed calls on my phone, loads of missed calls. And I'm thinking, eh? he doesn't normally ring me. So I normally have my things I flick on in the morning, so you have different things, you, you, your newspaper app or BBC Sports. I flicked on the Mail Online Sport, boom, Jason Tindall, like, sacked. So I, I'm like, Nat, I said, Natalie, Natalie, have, have you seen this? And she goes, oh, my God. So I get on the phone to Jace. I went, Jace, what, what's happening, mate? He says, I've, I've been sacked. I was, like, literally gobsmacked. I couldn't believe it. Obviously, the, the, the technical di uh, director rang me and told me the, the, the situation. And they did try to get on hold of me on that night, but I'd, I'd, be, I'd been in bed. So waking up in the morning, you see loads of missed calls. You don't see you. So, yeah. Um, and then they said to me, Do you, would, would, would you be interim manager for the time being with, with Perchie? I went, it's not the idealist situation I've ever been involved in my life. I know no one here. I don't know the coaches. I don't know anyone. <laughs> I said, "Listen, I'll give it my my best go uh, for the for the football club." Um, so so I did. I give it everything I had, uh, and work with the the coaches who are, who have been brilliant. Everyone's been so welcoming. Over at the the pavilion's been second class, um, and hopefully I have been to them as well. Um, I'm a, I'm a generally nice nice lad. He's someone easy to get on with. That's the public side of it. Jonathan, now what about the private side of it? You just mentioned Natalie and two mm. children as well. They obviously would have come down with you yeah. and you know, they'd come down in the car and you're the coach and then five minutes later you're interim manager yeah. and then and then you're head coach. What what's it been like for them? Um the kids are really <laughs> they don't really under, they understand. Um but bringing them down, they were excited to come to Bournemouth because it is a big thing for me to move, move the family, move the family down, especially young kids and my wife has a dance school. The luckiest thing I'd say we're in we were in uh, the restrictions around me. So that was a that was a big thing where they weren't at school. So I brought them down and they really they really enjoyed it. But like I say, my wife was really pushy to me to come down. She said, oh, what do you think I should do? Natalie, do you think I should go? What what do you think? She went, Go. You've got to, you've got to do it if you wanna if you wanna do it, if you wanna try and coach again and get yourself on the map again. I think that's important. So she was the one who really pushed me and you know, you have to have a you have to have a good wife. And I've got that. I've got two lovely kids and, you know, I'm lucky enough to have them. You said dance school? Yeah, she has a dance school for young kids so, in uh, Middlesbrough. You didn't think it's a darts school, did you? No, no, no. I'm just thinking that, you know, as we always like to say, other dance schools are available. But no, Nat we can Nat definitely play the manager's dance school. Natalie Woodgate's dance school coming it's to Bournemouth. The, it's called the Downing <laughs> Dance Academy because she's uh, Stuart Downing's sister. So it's called Downing Dance Academy. Will there be a, up in Middlesbrough. a branch coming to Bournemouth soon for everybody to join? Added. It's a bit too expensive down here. <laughs> <laughs> Think of the prices you could charge, though. <laughs> now, in your podcast with Jamie Carragher, he asked if you would do things differently in your next management job, what you would change and what you learned from Middlesbrough. Let me ask, what have you done differently since you've been here and what have you changed? Um, firstly, I'd like to say I was really, really happy with my staff at Middlesbrough extremely happy what I'd have done to that staff I'd have added an experienced head like I've just done with Joe Jordan I didn't want to make that same mistake twice I think Joe was really important to bring in someone who's been there done it got experience of different scenarios which you're going to come up against so that was the the, the biggest thing really um, and the most important things when I was at Middlesbrough I tried to change the style of football probably too quick in my view um, see in football you can have all this philosophy philosophy whatever till it's coming out of your ears if you aren't getting results you aren't getting a job you're getting sacked so when I got the Bournemouth interim it's important for me to get results or then I don't get a job again in football and I think about going into Middlesbrough again in them first few games I just try no matter how you get these results you get them and then you can build your philosophy when you can buy yourself more time because if you're getting sacked after five games or whatever, you ain't got a chance to build your philosophy. So you've got to buy yourself time, then you can start implementing of what you really want when you've bought yourself more time. You also said in that podcast that managers need time um, and you can't ch change the style of a player in six months or it takes longer than that. Well, 
it's fair to say that time probably isn't on your side here. <laughs> no, <it's not. laughs> I agree it's not on your side, but you've got to do it as well as you can. And I think over the games, we've done that as a, as a team. Um, I've tried to implement different different things within the group. Um, and I think it's benefiting the, benefiting the team. Um, you don't have the UEFA Pro licence at the moment, do you? I think that's no. that's right in saying you don't have to have it to manage in the Championship, no. but you would do in the Premier League. I mean, let's say we're being optimistic and things and we, we don't know what will happen beyond the summer, but is it an aim for you? Yeah, I'm look, I'll, be looking, I'll be looking to take that. Obviously, with COVID restrictions, it's been super difficult to do anything like that. So I would have had it by now if we wouldn't have been in COVID. Um, we've taken up nearly the best part of an hour of your time so far, Jonathan. We're going to um, let you go shortly. We've got a few supporters' questions that we need to, to to get out as well. I've got to say, by the way, on that subject, we had so many. Uh, that we're Sorry if we don't get to yours. We've had literally millions. Obviously, one or two we had to filter out due to them not being appropriate, but yeah. most of them uh, were very good questions. We just don't have time for all of them. A couple more short ones for us to finish with, though, first of all. Um, Footballers' recall always seems to be amazing. They can remember every game, every good game, every bad game, who they tackled, who they fouled for a yellow card. Your recall has proved to be brilliant over this hour as well. But what mementos have, have you got? Are you, a, are you a memorabilia kind of person? Have you got some of your shirts or other people's shirts framed on your son's wall or something? Not one. Nothing? Nothing. They're all in a box in the garage, probably. It's really? all England caps. Yeah. What does it mean? doesn't mean that. I'm not one. I'm not. A lot, some players like it, some players do. I'm not one of them. No. I'd have a bit of Mackenzie Mackenzie Thought pictures up there or something. An artist born in Middlesbrough. I was just about to ask him. I was thought I was going to be a lack of culture, not knowing who Mackenzie Thought was. But yeah. no, I'm not. I've got them. Listen, they're all in the garage somewhere. And one day I'll show my son. But it doesn't really it doesn't float me board. Does he look you up on YouTube and things? How do you sort of demonstrate what how good Dad was? Does, does, it, does he what? Does, does he look he, me up on, on YouTube? Does he watch clips <laughs> of you on YouTube? How, I, how don't know. I don't know if there's that many bits on there. <laughs> to be honest with you, I got a cracking video made when I was at Spurs from there uh, from the analysis lads. Michael Edwards was doing a, a cracking like a DVD. It was unbelievable and everything. I'll have to find it. To be honest with you, and show him. But it was uh, it was brilliant. Paul Hart, he said he was a beast. Uh, has that translated into your management style? Uh, he's a, he, listen, Paul Hart was beyond his years, and I'd say being a coach. I mean, his pre-season friendlies as an under-18s Leeds coach, he used to blow a whistle and say for five minutes, you've got to keep, your, keep the ball in your own half. This was back in 1996-97. So he was beyond his years and how we used to play football. We used to sometimes play two at the back for our Leeds youth team with... We used to play 2 4 4, and everyone just going, and me and Damien Lynch at the back who can defend 2 1 2. So he used to do things like that. But listen, you can, you can take different things from different, different managers of work with good, good and bad. Uh, he was my youth team coach at the time, and someone who I were hold in the highest regard. Best and worst decisions of your career? The, uh, worst decision was coming, signing for Middlesbrough full time when I should have done that year on loan. Um, Best decision was signing for for Leeds as a schoolboy and getting out of Middlesbrough. Just quickly, did you have other interests at that point when you were signing for Leeds? Were there other clubs floating around then, or was it just yeah, Leeds? Other, yeah, other clubs, yeah. But Leeds, Leeds was for me. Um, you've mentioned your son plays and you you coach his team a little bit. Does it? Yeah. Does you, you got a daughter as well? Does she play? No, she's a little dancer. She's the dancer. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was going to say she is. we've got a very successful stable of uh, former Bournemouth players' children in the academy here as well. By the yeah, way, yeah, so I've you, heard there's a few in there. Yeah. We, we can offer your son a contract potentially. If you, you, you decide are you these academy, things. Are you are academy <laughs> manager. I've just appointed myself. Well, I've just appointed myself. A um, couple of support questions to finish with Neil. Do you want to do Chris's first of all, or Kevin's? Can I just ask one yes, the please. one final question yes, from, from us? Um, you can ask as many as you want. I don't the, 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 this is just one more from us before we wrap up. Um, now you scored, obviously, the own goal for Real Madrid, but you did score a much more higher-profile own goal in the eyes of Bournemouth fans at the Riverside yeah. in 2013 yeah. when you turned Elliot Ward's cross past your own goalkeeper. Yeah, you went 2-0 up, didn't you? We drew 2-2. 3-3. Two, 3-3. Two. Three, three. Three, three. You're right. I remember, I remember going 2-0 up. I remember thinking to myself, we'll get back in this game because you just got promotion that year, didn't you? Yeah. I think you did. He did. Yes. Matt Ritchie was playing. That's right. It was our first season back yeah. and then we went up the following yeah, season. I remember. What do you remember about that day? No, I, I, I remember just facing the wrong way, old age, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to be putting that one up there, Neil, just to finish the hour, yeah. isn't it? Just to, uh, to rub it in. Um, go on then, let's go to some of the supporters' questions. Ian Hens been asked about mementos. I've just uh, asked that one, Ian, without actually realising that you'd uh, put it on the list of questions. Um, Clive on Twitter asks, as a defender, who would you say your hardest opponent was in your career? 
Uh, I've got three. Shearer for physical uh, attributes, for getting in the box and difficult to mark. Henri, speed and pace. And Suarez. Suarez was, I, I played Suarez when I was at Stoke for a little, coming to my end of my career, I'd say. But he was like, I, I didn't normally get rolled by centre forwards, but every time I was getting near him, he was rolling me. And I couldn't understand why. It was like, it was ridiculous how like how strong he was and how he worked his body around you. And he was he was very tough to play against. Kevin Anderson asks, you played under some of the greatest managers, Venables, Capello, Robson. What have you taken from them that you can bring to your own management style? I'd, I'd say man management, more than anything. Um, with your players, honesty is a is a massive thing. Just be honest with your players. They might not like you for the for the for the first hour or whatever, but if you're honest with them, they'll, they'll appreciate it. If you fill them full of lies and telling someone it's not true, they can see through it. Um, a question from Talking Cherries, which is our supporters' mental health initiative here at AFC Bournemouth. What is the greatest mental challenge you've faced in your career? And you might have answered this already. Yeah, when you? I was out for a year in Spain. Toughest out there on your own in a foreign country, 24-year-old kid from Middlesbrough. Difficult to deal with, but you uh, you find a way. I know you're a you're a fan of boxing and uh, Chris Billum Smith, who is a fan of this this club, the yeah. Commonwealth Champion. He submitted a question: Who is your favourite artist or band? Band, well, I, I do like the Drifters. Um, I like Bob Marley and the Whalers. Um, I like a lot of Motown as well. You know, like a lot of old school stuff, which I can dance to now and again. <laughs> now and again. <laughs> If you want some dated old school music, can I recommend BBC Radio Solent, the station I work for, which has got that coming out of your ears, Jonathan, yeah, 24-7. I'll some of the music a, from yesteryear. I'll have to have a listen. <laughs> get That'll get cut out, definitely. <laughs> uh, Plugging. Yeah. Uh, final one uh, from the supporters' questions comes from Neil Snowden, who says, comparing your time from Middlesbrough to now, within yourself, what is better or what is the biggest thing that's changed? From? From being at Middlesbrough to coming here now. Uh, a- the pressure, at, I'd say the pressure at Middlesbrough from just say uh, the fans because it's a, it's a north east of the country it, everyone's on, on top of you it's a bit more different down here I mean I know there's pressure but up there being a local lad was, there was a lot of pressure on you I enjoyed the pressure though to be honest with you and that's an interesting one to finish with did you feel a different pressure here because you've come in completely from the outside and you've got to prove yourself yeah yeah definitely yeah that's 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 one thing for sure um, and like I said the local being a local lad there's a lot more pressure with it well, we've taken up the, uh, well over an hour of your time, John. Is that all the questions from the fans, is that it? Well, we had, honestly, there was there was loads. There was loads. We had to filter some out. Um, <laughs> and we didn't want to take up any more than your time than we, we had to because you've got a busy week here preparing for, for matches. But, Jonathan, I think this has been hopefully really, really valuable for, for Bournemouth fans to get to know a bit more about you and to hear about your career. Because, obviously, when you're having to bat off questions from me and Neil in the press conference, yeah. it's, uh, we don't get to uh, to hear the real you, do we, sometimes with... Uh, I'm not saying you, you don't uh, expand on things, but what I'm saying is that sometimes it's not I like time. To, I like to keep my answers really short and sharp when I speak to <laughs> you. I don't like to babble on for too long. There's it's not different time. different podcast. Yeah, but... there's, t- there's not time, is there? Um, but Jonathan, thank you very much for joining us. No problem. You're welcome. Well, Neil, um, often we only get, what, three, four, five minutes sometimes with the manager post-match when he's uh, rushing off to do other things. So to get to sit for over an hour and, and hear a lot more about the man, I think hopefully fans will have, will have learnt a lot in that hour. It's a fascinating insight, Chris, into somebody that Bournemouth fans will have known about during his career, during his Leeds career and Newcastle and playing career and England career, but not so much behind the scenes about, you know, his wife's got a dancing school and, he, you know, he was a Middlesbrough fan as a youngster and knew exactly that Bournemouth had beaten them to the title in 1987. Very, very impressive. Another thing to remember, Chris, one of the very few people in recent years who's had no traditional history with the club who's been put into that role. You know, you look at Jason and Eddie and Mel Machin and all the other people, Sean O'Driscoll, all had a lot of history with the club. Jonathan had absolutely no history with the club before he came here. So it was fascinating to get the insight into all of that. Absolutely, yes. Don't forget to uh, to subscribe and give us a rating if you've enjoyed listening to, to Jonathan Woodgate. We'll and if you haven't heard any of our previous episodes, then do pop back on your podcast platform to, uh, to listen to some of our previous episodes as well with the likes of Richard Hughes and Jack Wilshere, amongst others as well. Share us on social media. The hashtag is AFCBpod. And as ever, we do invite your questions and your suggestions as to who may be here at the club you would like to hear from in future episodes. Make sure you're following AFC Bournemouth on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter and the other social channels as well. And we very much hope you've enjoyed our chat with the Cherries head coach, Jonathan Woodgate. From myself, Chris Temple and Neil Perrett, 
Thanks for listening.